Just when you say, I am never gonna buy another garden plant, you walk into a place like Bates Nursery and what do you see? You see all of these new plants that they're gonna entice us with and I have to say, Talking to David Bates, we've already put together things that uh, I believe have new interest in small space gardens. So David, I'm gonna start with this one right here. All right, I don't know why you'd want to. This is David Viburnum. I know. And I don't think it was named after me. This is really not a new introduction. However, this is a plant that's pretty new to our area. Now, here's one of the things you wanna keep in mind. David Viburnum is not the most hardy of plants. It needs to be in a spot where you give it a little protection. They will get some burn in the winter. It's not unusual, but uh, the, if you can get it through the winter months and give it a little bit of protection, you get the great fruit, you get the wonderful flowers on it, and that lush foliage is absolutely just, just, stunning. Okay, move us on. All right, next we've got, and you think of pyracanthus, you think of big old stickers and a lot of berries. This actually is called silver lining pyracanthus. Now, wow. what, what is really uh, unusual about it, it has very few thorns. I just found more. It has very few berries, but what it also has is tremendous winter and fall color. It turns a fuchsia pink, the foliage does, it's a, it is almost a completely bulletproof plant in that it can be planted by the hottest pavement and parking lot area. A lot of people are really into edibles in their landscape and this shrub right here says, well, what, what's the point? This is bountiful blue blueberry. And you can see it's already loaded with fruit. It is, I The great see thing that. about blueberries is, is uh, I think everyone should have at least two in their landscape though. Bountiful blue, is self-fertile. It does not require a pollinator. However, right. all blueberries do better if they have a second one. Right. But they are what I would call an intermediate grower. Mm -hmm. They only get three to four feet in height. They don't get up six to seven feet tall like many of them do. So mm -hmm. if you had a hedge where you formerly had, say, dwarf Burford holly or something like that, you could remove that and plant these in there. You have every bit as beautiful a hedge and you get the great bonus of having blueberries and I love them. I cannot get enough of them. And the fall color of the leaves. They have beautiful orange and red hues. It is a stunning grower, beautiful mm -hmm. plant. Well, let's see, to your right there. That's now, a this is a very interesting plant. This is called Taylor Juniper. Now, for those of you who are interested in something that mimics the growth habit of an Italian cypress, mm -hmm. this is the choice for Middle Tennessee areas or pretty much anywhere that's in the east. Uh, Taylor juniper is a, uh, a sport that was discovered off of an eastern red cedar, the Juniperus virginiana. This mm -hmm. was discovered in Nebraska, but what makes that significant is that it's very winter hardy, and obviously cedars do really well here. So and it's very pencil Very, cylindrical. very thin, very festigated, as we like to say in the industry, so it grows very upright and columnar. So it's I a great choice if you've got a, vertical. a tall, <laughs> vertical gardening situation, it's great for that. Yes. Now let's look on down here for a moment. See this ever red laurel pedalum and they don't call it ever red for nothing. Even when it's not in flower, it has that beautiful crimson foliage on it and of course when the uh, fringe flower or lower petalum blooms are coming out as they're just beginning to do it really has a tremendous show these will flower all over all summer the fireworks purple fountain grass uh, you're very familiar with the ones that you've seen that are, that are commonly used as an annual. This right. one also is an annual, so you're going to want to use it in mixed containers or in planter beds where you expect to have to replant that every year. And this has a uh, an upright red growth habit and of course you get a lot of great flowers on it in the springtime. It is another new introduction from Monrovia and a, a beautiful accent or addition to the landscape. One of the trees I find of greatest interest is the jade butterfly ginkgo. This is a true dwarf ginkgo. This tree, where a standard ginkgo, it's not unusual for them to reach maybe 40 to even 60 feet in height. Oh, no. and they get huge. This tree only gets to be about 14 to 15 feet tall. So for many landscapes, it's a far superior choice. It'll stay well within its bounds. Many people live in Smaller Condo. areas, condominiums, courtyard areas where they, they want a tree, they want that form, but they simply don't have the space for something that gets quite so large. And that is absolutely wonderful. And their fall color, the leaves. Spectacular gold color. So they're a wonderful choice for, for areas where you just don't have the room for a full grown tree. Is it true that those leaves on those trees just are there all of a sudden and then boom, they're all it's the Pretty ground. much is true. And they say that uh, ginkgo is great for your memory, but I, I keep forgetting to take it. <laughs> okay, David, I picked this one out. Yes, and Tabletop Blue is a great juniper, and while I have never actually seen anyone 
To use it on a tabletop, it closely resembles that form where it grow, takes a nice flat shearing on top. It really gives you that real feel of a, of a blue uh, surface that you're growing on. So if you need something that's really great for establishing some bones in the landscape, yes. really that distinctly blue color, it's a great background plant for other things, perhaps small deciduous plants in the forest. Well, and I just like the fact that I'm always looking to trying to not have to plant something every year to give color. And I just am drawn to the blue foliage and, and just look how it plays off of the pinks and the reds and the yellows, that this is a necessary color for and, our garden. And, and not just color, but texture. Right. You know, and that's a, a big factor when you're thinking of your landscape. You don't want all broadleaf or all conifers. Uh, frankly, you want a mixture of all things. When you have a mixture of grasses, deciduous conifers and broadleaves, it gives you not only the color of of perhaps the flowers and foliage, it gives you that contrasting contrast of the foliage, which really creates interest and makes their landscape look complete. Yeah, and I guess you'd say as variety is the spice of life in the garden, right? Absolutely. It surely is. Well, David, as I knew, I'm in trouble already. Thank you for your time today, David. I know it's a busy day. You've piqued my interest and I know you have others and I think I want to put my name on one of these. Well, you better speak up quick there. As the new introductions go, they're kind of limited in selection. So okay. get well, you one. Thank you so much. Thank you and then we appreciate you coming out today.